Okay, what um, I said I would do last like, would look at what some folks said about John. And uh, I got to thinking about that today, and I thought there's no use reading through what all these characters had to say about him. Um, I will read one that basically sums up what four or five I had uh, going, I was going to quote from, but I've quoted from this fellow before, Farrer, and he wrote this, and I'm quoting from him, concerning John's account of the gospel. In this gospel, we catch, as it were, the final whisper of the voice of Christ as it echoed in the heart of the disciple he loved. I think that's a, a real good statement to sum up John, especially in view of the way John referred to himself. I think he would be pleased with such a comment. I again, want to emphasize what I have all the way through this that while each writer of the gospel accounts had their reason for writing and inspiration was behind it all, um, got to remember that you don't get the full picture of the Christ and his earthly ministry, except that you read all of them. We ought to always keep that in mind. One thing that I haven't said in view of the fact that each one of the writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, wrote for specific audiences during their time, is that it does show that you can tailor the gospel to a given audience as to their situation. Truth won't change, but certain things uh, you might want to bear down on or emphasize when you're trying to teach certain people relative to their culture or their uh, social environment, whatever it might be. Because this is what happened when Matthew wrote for the Jews and Mark wrote for the Latin speaking world, Luke wrote for the Gentiles, and John wrote the way that he did. Uh, to me, John, uh, if you're just going to use one book to try to reach people, then John would be the one to take, if you were limited to one book, which we're not, to try to show and prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, for that's the very purpose of the book. In reality, that's the purpose of the whole Bible, but nevertheless, we're talking about the four accounts of the gospel and specifically John. I also mentioned last week we would try to look at some of the uh, words that were used by John, and I guess the first one that comes to mind is, in the beginning was the word, which in the Greek is the logos. We get logic from that word. And it, you can get into some in-depth study on in the beginning was logic. In the beginning was, was reason. In the beginning was rational powers of the divine mind. Um, a word is a sign of an idea. It's a vehicle of thought. So if I would know the ideas of God, I've got to know the word of God. If I'm to speak to people the ideas of God, then I must preach the word, which is what Paul said. So the term was used, of course, in the ancient world. Uh, some of you might have heard of the Jewish philosopher. His works have come down to us by the name of Philo. Uh, he was located in Alexandria, Egypt, which was a seat of learning among the Jews and had one of the greatest libraries in the world. And much of the ancient literature that we lost happened when the library in Alexandria burned. But here's what he called the Logos. And I'm quoting, the second God, the archetype of the visible world, the ideal unity of all things, the idea of ideas the image of God by whose means the whole universe was created, the source of life and holiness. Well, of course, he was a Jew, and he didn't believe in Christ and all of that. Besides that, if you read his works, besides being about as boring as they can get, he got a lot of wild ideas that not any faithful Jew would have upheld. Nevertheless, his works have come down to us, and we have a lot of insights into a lot of things because of that. 
But that's what he said about logos, uh, translated word. John used that word many times, and of course, applying it to the Christ. Then he also used two terms, um, light and darkness, light and darkness. He used the word light 21 times and darkness seven times. We don't have to have a lot of explanation on this. We know that Jesus or John is depicting Christ and his kingdom as the realm of light. Uh, light would be synonymous with truth, which he also uses a lot. Satan and all of his servants or his kingdom would, of course, be identified as the realm of darkness. So the book is the account of the struggle between light and darkness, between truth and lie. Now, just think for a minute as you live your daily life, life and uh, think about how much of it has to do with, now, is this the truth uh, or is it not? And think of all that uh, law goes through to try to prove, to try to show, to verify that something is the truth. And when you hear somebody say that you didn't want to, you don't want to have facts get in the way of truth, you know that person has something terribly wrong with his understanding of how you arrive at the truth. You can't arrive at the truth on any subject unless you have the facts well in hand that pertain to that subject. And the fact is just a fact. It, you can't alter it. It's just what it is. And when you concern yourself with proving that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, then you want to know the facts in the case. And, of course, you think about all of that when it comes to uh, legal matters. But after all, John is offering proof that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, is the Savior of the world. So we're concerned about light and darkness. We're concerned about uh, the facts and case and being able to establish the truth of a matter by the facts and the case. He also uses the word life, L-I-F-E, life. And he uses it more than 35 35 times, he talks about like live and have life and uh, this kind of thing is added to the 35 times he uses the word life some 15 more times. So he deals with that quite a bit. And uh, he's dealing with it primarily from the standpoint of life in Christ or salvation from sins and being in Christ. And that's how he uses the term. I always get interested, though I may never all the time figure it out as to why did the Holy Spirit have him use these words and what was on his mind as the Spirit guided him in selecting these words for the purpose that he was writing. Why did he use them? And there must be some lesson in that that I can glean by understanding something about why he used uh, logos or light and darkness or life or let live and have life. There's another one that he used, uses, and that's signs, S-I-G-N-S, signs. This is how John refers to the miracles that Jesus did. It comes from the Greek word semia, and... Um, it means that the miracles are signs. Well, if they're signs, they're signs of somebody. What good would a miracle be if it wasn't seen by somebody else to accomplish the purpose that God intended by the working of the miracle? So really, uh, if you would get real strict in defining miracles, they must be signs. Um, signs to whom? Well, to those, they were done before to accomplish in those that saw them what he intended. 
And all you have to do is read through the books of the gospel to see the impact that miracles had on people. They were signs that God was with the doer of the miracle. It's like it said uh, with Nicodemus, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these signs which thou doest, these miracles. So even though he didn't understand those signs said, this is the Messiah, the Son of God, he knew from his study of the Old Testament that prophets were always given uh, miracles to prove who they were. So when you think of a miracle, think of it being done for the benefit of somebody else. And it was to be a sign in the case of Christ that he is a son of God. So you got, we're back to what we've quoted many times before, John 20, 30, 31, and uh, many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples and so on. Uh, so they were signs to them to prove that he was son of God. Again, remember Thomas, when he actually saw the resurrected body of Christ, he knew it was the body of Christ, the same body that was crucified and died on the cross and went into the tomb because he could see the nail scars in his hands and feet and the scar of the spear in his side. And his conclusion from that sign was, by, being, by him knowing from them, this is truly the resurrected Christ, my Lord and my God. And that should be when you take the compilation of all the signs, you sum them all up. That's what they were designed to do, is to bring us to believe. God doesn't ask us to believe something without adequate evidence. He just doesn't. He made us rational creatures. He made us intellectual creatures. He made us so that we could reason from the facts and draw definite conclusions and come to a proper knowledge of the truth. So he doesn't bypass the way he created us to convince us that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the son of God. Barclay said in his commentary concerning John, to him, quote, a miracle was never an isolated act. It was always a window into the reality of that which Jesus always was and is. And I thought that an interesting comment regarding the idea of the miracles of Christ being signs that he was the son of God. Um, there are some paradoxes of Christ that the apostle John reports he is presented as majestic, yet he dies a shameful death. He was virtuous, yet he experienced indignity. He was omnipotent, yet he died in weakness. And though he claimed to possess living water, he died thirsting. He presented himself as the light of the world, yet he died in darkness. Even the creation, you might say, held the light, recognizing that the great creator died when the great darkness came and the earthquake shook the world. And the, as the song says, as the mighty maker died. He said he was the life yet he died sooner than the other victims on the cross. By his own will, it is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So he had control of his life. He could take it up, he could lay it down. And when he had uh, fulfilled all he came to do, suffered to the uttermost, satisfied his father in paying what it took to save us from our sins and the suffering and on the cross, then he says, it's finished. I've completed my task. No use doing any more. You know, one of the things about God is that there's nothing wasted with God. Whatever God does is done just exactly enough, no more, no less. 
So when Christ had suffered to the uttermost, then he willed himself to die and commended, commended his spirit to the Father. I mentioned last week the idea of sevens, and in the apocalyptic literature, seven means complete. But the apostle introduces seven, seven signs to uh, establish the lordship of Christ. I mentioned uh, he turned the water into wine. That was the first uh, miracle that he did, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Then he healed the nobleman's son, chapter 4, 46 through 54. He uh, healed the man at Bethsaida, chapter 5, verses 1 through 47. He fed the 5,000, chapter 6, 1 through 14. And he walked on the water, chapter 6, 15 through 21. He healed the blind man, chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. And then he raised Lazarus from the dead, chapter 11, verses 1 through 57. I also mentioned the I am statements of Christ, and which, of course, he is setting forth his claims of what he is, who he is. I am the bread of life, chapter 6, verse 35. I am the light of the world, chapter 8, verse 12. And he says, uh, before Abraham was, I am, chapter 8, verse 58. He calls himself uh, the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd, chapter 10, verse 11. I am the resurrection and the life, chapter 11, verse 25. I am the way, the truth, and the life, chapter 14, verse 6. And I am the true vine, chapter 15, verse 1. You might also take note sometime of the fact that he offers seven witnesses, which I, I remind you of that we've talked about before. But uh, for as we move on, we'll look at the chronology of John. Our... Uh, current B.C. and A.D. calendar is actually based on the birth of Christ. And most people recognize that there's a four-year error in it. Uh, December 5 B.C. to December 26 A.D., that's Christ's years of preparation. John doesn't deal with these. There's nothing about them in the book of John. And in uh, from December 26 A.D. to April 27 A.D., we have what people have called his inauguration, chapter 1, 19 through chapter 2, verse 12. From April 27 A.D. to December 27 A.D., up through April 29 A.D., you have his ministry up in Galilee, chapter 4, 43 through chapter 6, verse 71. April 29 A.D. to December 29 A.D. You have his, like a better way to put it, retirement ministry, April, October. And then later his Judean ministry, October, December, chapter 7, verse 2, through chapter 10, verse 39. Then December 29th A.D. to April 30 A.D., you have the Perean ministry, chapter 10, 40 through 12, 11. And then the last one, April through May in 30 A.D., the final weeks of his life, we have recorded not only that, but of course his death, resurrection, and ascension, chapter 12, verses 21 through chapter 21, verse 25. That I doubt people will remember, but it does show the periods of time that John wrote about. And I mentioned last week that he spends a lot of 
lot of time in his book writing about brief periods in the life of the Lord. That's important to keep in mind when you're reading it. If I were to summarize John's account of the of uh, the gospel, I think I could do it this way through five what individuals thought of Christ, uh, chapter six through ten what Christ said about himself, and then chapters 11 through 20, what the crowds thought about Christ. Looking at outline of John, which it's interesting to me that he covers uh, really such a limited part of our Lord's work. Yet at the same time, there's so much said. We've already mentioned uh, chapter one, verses one through 18. We may have, I may have called it the prologue earlier last week, but anyway, we'll call it that. Chapter one, one through 18. And this of course deals with Christ before he became flesh. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Um, let me make a few comments along that line. When I've taught a class on the Godhead, on deity, I think one of the bigger things that I've come away with every time I've studied it is not only the things that you know that you may not have thought about or realized the Bible taught about deity, but when you finish with what you do know, it stands out more and more that you come away with how much you don't know because you're dealing with a divine mind. You're dealing with a being that has no beginning or ending, it's not like man. It's not limited by time and space. In fact, it created time and space. Um, it's rather interesting. So when you think of deity, we end up talking about how there's one God and one Lord and one spirit. How do you have three and yet you have only one? Well, we may never fathom all of that, but we can understand that when you use the word God, capital G-O-D, you can substitute the word deity for God. And what do we mean by that? There's one deity. We simply mean there's one divine essence. And that's about the best way you can refer to the one deity, to the one God. But that one divine essence is revealed in three persons. Now, that's where we kind of have a problem. But think of it this way. It may help us in our limited mind. You've heard me say this, at least some of you have before, that there, if you have a triangle, you have one, one triangle. But the essence of that triangle means it has three sides. And if we can at least in material things, things that we can experience through our five senses, understand that you can have three in one, then that may help us a little bit in understanding how you have one God or one divine essence, but there are three persons. And deity could not be deity, for sake of thinking it through, except in those three persons. Now, when Jesus became flesh, became a human being, there were things that changed. Uh, one thing that's quite obvious is that he said concerning the end of time, I don't know, the angels don't know, only the Father knows. But he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with thee before the world was. 
That doesn't mean at this time he doesn't know. But it did mean when he was in the flesh, in his earthly ministry, that he didn't know. So there were some limitations placed upon him when he was a human being. If nothing else, you can see it this way. James says of deity of God, he cannot be tempted with evil. Question, was Jesus Christ tempted? You're going to answer yes. Something had to change. God in his pureness, in his fullness, could not be tempted with evil. But yet when Jesus divested himself of the form, now notice I said form, the form of deity, and took upon himself the form of man or became a human being, he put himself in a position as a human being, as you are and I am and all other men, to be tempted. So there were some limitations placed on Christ as a human being in his earthly ministry that was necessary for him to accomplish his work in saving us from our sins. Thus, he overcame Satan as a human being. We couldn't. He did. Now, then how did he know what was in man? For the Bible says plainly he knew what was in man. Well, that's the reason that he had the spirit without measure. I don't know how it works because we don't have all the details involved. If we did, might not understand it. But I do know that the Holy Spirit gave him the miraculous powers needed when he needed to draw on them to be able to do those things that he did. Yet, he overcame sin as a man. So there were limitations placed on him when he took upon himself the flesh and dwelt among us, as John says, and they beheld him. And we already mentioned last week the various things that demonstrated that he was a man and his uh, feelings and his emotions and his actions. That's how he brought everything into subjection to his father. I do always those things that please the father. Well, that meant he will so to do and did what he will to do with purpose of mind. So he was able as deity in the flesh, as deity and human, to bring his humanity into complete obedience to, gospel, to, to God. And thus you have in Hebrews 5 and verse 9 that he's, um, well, first of all, Hebrews 5, 8, that though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. You know, think about that for a while, that in becoming a man and being fleshly and the appetites of a man and the desires of a man, and whatever he underwent on this earth, he did so in bringing his life in perfect submission to God, never deviating from it. Be able to make a comment, I do always those things that please my father, or my meat is to do the father's will. My sustenance is to do it. You will remember one time when uh, the disciples came back looking for food at the time he was dealing with the woman at the well, and uh, he made the comment to them, I have meat that ye know not of. There's a great lesson in that because the person today who fills himself with God's word, understands it, who knows how it directs his life, and he keeps his mind in subjection to the mind of Christ, then he has insights and he has knowledge, he has understanding. He has meat the world does not know of. So you had the word of God prior to the incarnation, chapter 1, 1 through 3 in the prologue, and then you had the mission of Christ in the world in verses 4 through 18 of chapter 1. You have uh, signs, interviews, and teachings of Christ, chapter 1, 19 through chapter 4, 54. Uh, John, the immerser, the forerunner of Christ, verses 19 through 34, chapter 1. You had the testimony of the first disciples in chapter 35 through 51 of chapter 1. 
again, you have the wedding at Cana in chapter 2, 1 through 11. You have him cleansing the temple, chapter 2, 12 through 25. And you have his discussion with Nicodemus, chapter 3, 1 through 21. And John the Baptist confesses Christ's superiority in chapter 3, verses 22 through 36. And you have Christ and the woman of Samaria, chapter 4, 1 through 42. And you have the healing of the nobleman's son at Capernaum in chapter 4, 43 through 54. Then you have a break that we could call Christ in Controversy, chapter 5, verse 1, through chapter 6, verse 71. Um, you remember a few years ago we had a lectureship, Christ the Great Controversialist. If you see Christ presented today many times by those who purport to be his friends, then you really realize they're his enemies. They cannot conceive of Christ ever causing controversy or being involved in controversy or being properly labeled controversial. Well, if there was man on this earth, it was controversial. It was Jesus Christ. Um, I say this section, chapter 5, 1 through chapter 6, 71, it covers the healing, healing the sick man at Bethsaida on the Sabbath, which got him into trouble, chapter 5, verses 1 through 18. Of course, when he claimed to be deity, chapter 5, 19 through 47, that didn't go over very well. When he fed the 5,000, what resulted from that, chapter 6, 1 through 15, was controversy. And then he walked on the water, chapter 6, 16 through 21. And a sermon on the bread of life, and that really caused a stir, chapter 6, 22 through chapter 7 and verse 1. And then I guess coming out of that controversy, being a controversial person, the conflict aspect of his controversial conduct is seen in chapter 7, verse 1 through chapter 12, verse 59 the unbelief of the brethren, chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. You have Jesus teaching in the city of Jerusalem, and you have the response of the people to the teaching, chapter 7, verses 10 through 52. You have the masses of the people being quite bewildered at him, chapter 7, 10 through 13. Then Christ goes into the temple and teaches, chapter 7, 14 through 24. And in chapter 7, verses 25 through 36, you have a mixed response of the people. And in chapter 7, verses 37 through 39, you have uh, what we might call Christ's climactic appeal in chapter 7, 40 through 52, there's the debate among the Jewish leaders regarding him. And in chapter 8, verse through, uh, verses 1 through 11, you have the woman taken in adultery. And I don't know, I pause here to say this, how people can read these things and say Jesus wasn't involved in conflict and controversy because in chapter 8, 12 through 59, Jesus debates with the Jewish leaders. And many times when he just did a good thing, it resulted in a big fallout. Chapter 9, verses 1 through 41, he healed the blind man, all the consequences of that. Then uh, the good shepherd, Christ the good shepherd, chapter 10, 1 through 18. Uh, he's accused of blasphemy in chapter 10, 19 through 42. Then there's the resurrection of Lazarus, chapter 11, verses 1 through 53. And he withdraws then to Ephraim, chapter 11, 54 through 57. And I give some thoughts sometimes on why Christ withdrew from the multitudes. I won't try to go into that now, but how he kept himself, I guess you'd say, kept himself straight with God and it involved a lot of getting away from people. The return to Bethany where Mary washes his feet in chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. 
Then there's the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem, chapter 12, 12 through 19. Then there were those Greeks who came to see Jesus in chapter 12, 20 through the through, uh, first part of verse 36. And then the actual rejection of the people, chapter 12, the latter part of 36 through verse 50. He then spends time talking intimately and privately with his apostles, chapter 13, 1 through chapter 17, verse 26, to demonstrate humble service and how far one should go in serving somebody else. He washes the disciples' feet in chapter 13, 1 through 17. And then, of course, he exposes Judas Iscariot and sends him away, chapter 13, 18 through 30. And then he goes about teaching the apostles some more and answering their questions, chapter 13, 31 through chapter 14, verse 31. This is where he talks about giving them a new commandment, chapter 13, 31 through 35. He entertains a question that Peter puts to him, chapter 13, 36 to 38. And then he makes that marvelous promise of the assurance of heaven in chapter 14, 1 through 4. You have the question uh, put to him by Thomas in chapter 14, 5 through uh, 7. And you have Philip's questions, chapter 14, 8 through 11. Then he starts his discussion with them of the promised coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I might emphasize again here that this is the parakletos association of the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, with the apostles. And that simply means he took the place, that is the Holy Spirit did, of Christ. When he says, I will send you another comforter, you can't send another without having a first one. Well, the first one was Christ in the flesh, and he's going to die. And thus, he wouldn't be with them anymore as he had been. But the Holy Spirit would come and have the same relationship with them invisibly, spiritually, that Jesus had had with them when he was on the earth. And this tells us a little more about why the apostles were able to bear up under so many things that it seemed like normal mortals could never have borne up under but they had him with them invisibly. Uh, you have Judas Thaddeus's question in chapter 14, 23 through 24. And then at the middle, in the middle of all this, or at the end of all of it, you have uh, him promising them peace, chapter 14, 25 through 31. This, of course, we could spend a lot of time on it. We've tried to at different times and different lessons and sermons show that the peace that Christ offers is not the peace of the world. Then there's lessons on relationships that come up in chapter 15, verse 1 through chapter 16, verse 4. You have the relationship of the disciples with Christ, verses 1 through 11 of chapter 15. And then, of course, their, their relationship one with another, verses 12 through 17, chapter 15 and their relationship with the world, chapter 15, 18 through chapter 16, 4. And this again ties in with the earlier things we said about the Holy Spirit. Uh, he promises them the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth, chapter 16, 5 through 33. It's important to understand that he either kept that promise with the apostles or he didn't. And if he did guide them into all truth, which he did, there's once the New Testament closes, there's no more truth to be revealed. So any of these latter-day revelators that come along simply are not giving you what God said. Uh, these characters like to say, well, I talk to Jesus all the time. He talks to me. Well, he's not going to tell you anything if he did any different than what they read in. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the rest of the New Testament. I always like to say to them, when they say, well, Jesus said this to me. Well, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit told me to tell you that wasn't Jesus, that was the devil. The truth of the matter is, in the Holy Spirit's word, the sword of the Spirit, he did tell me to tell them that. 
because all scripture is given the inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It's once for all delivered to the saints, Galatians 1, and then also Jude 3. So he guided them into all truth. We don't need another revelation, such as the Mormons claim, the Book of Mormon, and the Pearl of Great Price, and Doctrines and Covenants, where they get most of their doctrine. And they, of course, at least try to be consistent and claim to have apostles. But what are those apostles going to tell us that can't be found in the apostles' doctrine of Acts 2.42, which is the New Testament? Then you have the Lord's intercessory prayer in chapter 17, 1 through 26. And then there's the arrest and trial of Christ, chapter 18, 1 through chapter 19, verse 16. The arrest of Christ, 18, 1 through 11. The trial before Annas, 18, 12 through 27. You have the denials of the apostle Peter, chapter 18, 25 through 27. Then you have the trial of Christ before the Roman procurator Pilate, chapter 18, 28 to chapter 19, 16. Then you have the final hours of Christ in chapter 19, verses 17 through 42. And you have the crucifixion presented in chapter 19, 17 through 37. And then the burial of Christ in chapter 19, 38 through 42. You have the resurrection and appearances to different disciples, chapter 21 through 31. First of all, Mary, chapter 21 through 18. Then he appears to 10, 10 apostles, chapter 20, 19 through 23. Then you have his appearance to Thomas in chapter 20, 24 through 31. And if we may call it that, you have his epilogue in chapter 21, verses 1 through 25. And you have in, in that section the miraculous catch of fish in chapter 21, 1 through 14. You have the challenge issued by Christ to Peter in chapter 21, 15 through 17. And then you have the prediction in a general format, but prediction nevertheless of Peter's destiny in chapter 21, 18 through 25. There are a number of lessons I think we can get through them. We're about toward the end of the time we normally spend. But there's a few lessons we'll draw from this, and then we'll be ready to move into the book of Acts next time around. Or at least, well, we'll get started. Let's put it that way with some of these lessons. Um, i tell you what, it's already, at least by my clock, about 15 after 8. Let's just not get into the lessons. Let's just... Uh, have the lessons from John. We'll start in those next week. And that will say breaking them up at this time. So we'll call our quits tonight and do that next week. And that should give us time to get into the beginning parts of the Acts. Uh, we might say some of the Acts of some of the apostles. Okay, we'll call our quits. Any comments, questions?